Okay, so after the icebreaker, good afternoon again. I'm telling this while I'm recording. Um, I am the first one reported in this slide. I'm not pictured there, just the name. I am Luigi De Russis. I am an assistant professor here at Politecnico. And this is the first class of the human AI interaction PhD course. Uh, I have four, there are four, I don't remember if I'm, I'm going to remember all the four of you, of, of the four things that I would like to, to four disclaimers for you. Uh, the first one is that um, this will be, as I've wrote in the email, an interactive lecture. These and the following one. Meaning that I have no idea, I have not, never came to my mind to stay here and speak for three hours in a row. Absolutely. We all fall asleep, even probably after three hours of me speaking. Um, so what is happening here and today, is, so this is also why the silence that you were making before is bad, is that I will ask you to speak during the lecture and then during the exercise, well, the exercise, the practices are easier because you, you need to do some stuff for the course. Uh, and this is the first, the first thing. So be prepared to speak. Um, but also be prepared that uh, there is no wrong answer here. So, no, Feel free to fail, feel free to say stupid things. Nobody is going to blame you or even remember who said uh, a stupid thing or not. Uh, so this is as, as another disclaimer. And the other things that is a disclaimer is that sometimes, especially during this first lecture, so today and probably uh, lecture number three, class number three. Uh, I'm going to exaggerate a bit on some statement, on some sentences. So I will push a little bit something towards one direction or the other. And I will hopefully tell you that I'm exaggerating. Otherwise, I hope that you will be able to get it uh, or ask if you are in doubt. Um, so, why? Not just for, for the sake of exaggerating, but for uh, challenging you. Again, making this less boring and less a traditional lecture as possible, but more interactive. So to make you reflect on things, so pushing a little bit above the edge to prone you to have a reaction of some sort. And this is the, the, the other disclaimer. Then I'm sure that I have another things to say, but I will not remember it. So it's fine. Um, I will start with uh, a couple of questions for you again. One could be answered by raising your hand, the other one probably not. Um, how many of you work in your research uh, on artificial intelligence, whatever you want to define it. Okay, so basically almost 90%, 95%. Um, how many of you know who this thing here is? Good, you are in the right class now. Um, And um, that, that wasn't uh, the second question. The other question was, um, which are your expectations from this course? And now you have to speak, sorry. What do you expect? So after these 25 amazing hours that we are going to 
to have together? What do you expect to, to leave these rooms with? Again, there is no wrong answer in most cases. In this case, for sure, there is no wrong answer. Consider you, I, I'm repeating for the recording, just make it clear. Uh, considering human and AI interacting under different lenses, different perspective. Hopefully, yes. Someone that disagree or have anything else to add? So I'll just simplify some kind of interaction in some at least components like speech. Some idea, some idea, yeah. Find some way to integrate artificial intelligence in your project. Even if you are not already working on AI. That will be harder um, for this course here, but um, some ideas, some pointers at least, maybe for sure. Well, not, not for sure, <laughs> I hope so, uh, at least something. Another one, and then we can proceed. So to mitigate our bias to around AI, uh, since most of you are working in some way with, with AI, so you are in the AI field, right? So that is, that is nice. Um, I also like some verb that we use, integrate, mitigate, integrate, et cetera. Um, good, let's hope that you will tell me in the end of the course if it's, if it's, if it's right. So, first of all, before even starting speaking about human AI interaction, I ask you what, I ask you, yes, I ask you in the madness slide, what is to you human, in a word, what is uh, human interacting with AI? Um, and you answer that. So I, I'm not going to repeat, to ask again now. Um, so it, before even going there, let me tell you how this three hour will unfold, more or less. So the idea is that for the first half of this three hour, we are going to do this kind of introduction. Today we are going just to have an introduction to the course, to some definition, some basic term, some background information. And a sort of trailer, you can say, a sort of trailer of the entire course. We will also mention something that we will go deeper in, in the rest of the lectures and the exercise. Plus course content, how to get, how to pass this, this course, so how the exams work, et, et cetera. And then in the second half, more or less of the, well, a little bit less in the second half of the, of the class, we are going to do the madness session. So I'm going to display your slides the slide that you prepared, and those who are here, uh, when your slides appear on screen, you have one minute strictly, strict to introduce yourself, mm -hmm. using some content, either pictorial or written content that you put on the slide. It's a nice breaker. Mm -hmm. It's called the madness session, because you have just one minute, and I, after one minute, will change slide. So if you're speaking, you have to stop speaking. It's very quick. It's very quick also because you are like, well, you are 52 on for Teledera Didattica, you are less here, but if I have to imagine this for 52 people, I will need one hour, 52 minutes to, to do the Madden session. So you are a little bit less, but half an hour 
we are going to spend up an hour because one minute per each as an icebreaker. Hmm? So if you knew each other already as small groups, probably it's not needed, but maybe other people doesn't know. And we are, need, we are going to do some work group. So we need to build some group here. So this could be also an icebreaker. Um, and then in the end, last say 15 minutes or something like this, we are going, so as a third thing, and final things of today, I'm going to tell you which is the next the topic of the next lecture, or the next class. That will be an exercise. All four hours will be an exercise. It is already online on the website. And uh, it will be the only moment in which we are going to ask you to do something for this course before coming here. Because in that four hour, you are going to speak a lot. And hopefully, I'm not going to speak so much in those, for those lectures, for that specific lecture only, at least. But more on this after. So back to, let's try to set a baseline. Uh, do you know, and then I will add another disclaimer, but do you know these terms and what they mean? Classification, who knows what is classification? People that work in AI cannot know this term. But you should be there with your hands raised for all the time that these slides is, is on. So again, what, do you know what is classification? Who doesn't know? Never heard about classification in machine learning, again. No fear, no, no, no worries. Everybody knows the classification? Okay. Uh, clustering. Okay, no. let's do it slowly. What is classification? Ah, brief definition, quick definition. Yes, maybe giving a definition without using classification in in the definition could help. Okay. <laughs> okay, now let's, let's accept this one. Uh, it's not so easy as a definition, but it's to work. And clustering, how many of you don't know what is clustering? don't know. Everybody knows clustering. So as before, definition. To group some data. Yeah, some, some, sem yeah, some data according to some, to create cluster, right, of similar object according to some similarity criteria, whatever it is. And the difference between classification and regression. Anybody doesn't know what is this? Okay. <laughs> you spoke. <laughs> better. Um, can we say that they are basically more or less the same thing? They have the same objective, but one works on categorical object, mostly colors, something that are different. Red and, and white are not on a scale. You cannot move from one to another by, uh, yes, you can with colors, but, um, and when regression apply to continuous data, numbers, prices, numbers money, things that can, uh, unsupervised versus supervised learning. What else? Don't be shy.
What is supervised learning? Okay, who doesn't know what is supervised versus supervised? Do you understand? Given this definition? Not so much. Okay. Um, so we can simplify maybe this way. Uh, supervised learning, and then you are the expert here. Most of you are the expert here. Um, feel free to correct me. In supervised learning, so classification is part of supervised learning. Because you assign labels to things. You supervise the process of learning. You say, okay, this is a chair, and this is not. So this is supervised. Dear computer, dear algorithm, this is a chair. I give you the label of a chair if, you are, if it's a picture, and while this is a table, so this is another label. In unsupervised, clustering. In unsupervised, you have similar things that are got together in unsupervised way, so without a person saying, okay, this is this kind of information, right? Okay, uh, ontology, uh, here, here we are. Who knows what is an ontology? Okay, who doesn't know what is an ontology? Good. An ontology, because the ontology is not part of the data-driven artificial intelligence like machine learning and deep learning, ontology is part of artificial intelligence, not for the data-driven part. It's part of the knowledge representation, but it's still part of artificial intelligence. So an ontology is a way, a mathematical valid way, in which you can perform logical inference on the information you put in this data structure, and it's a graph. It's a graph that you can reason on a perspective of logical, mathematical logical, um, to infer new knowledge from that base of knowledge, base of behavior, base of uh, descriptive. So you represent a portion of the knowledge, and um, so just a representation of knowledge, plus some inferences. So you describe a specific domain a person creates an ontology and put in the ontology the knowledge that the person has. So it's not something that learn on its own or something that I show you 10 chairs and then I will give you a new chair and ask you what is this, a chair or not. It's not something that is. You describe what a chair is. A chair has four legs, could be colored or not, could have a function or not. You describe how the world is represented. So it's not data-driven machine learning, like, uh, sorry, data-driven AI, but still part of AI. So it's a, it's a large field. Uh, we, we are most doing example on the data-driven here in this course, on the data-driven AI, so machine learning, etc. But just to say that this is still part of AI. Um, the cold start problem, who knows what is? This has more or less random terms, but we are the artificial intelligence domain. Who doesn't know what is the cold start problem? All right. Um, the cold start problem is an unsolved, non, not totally at least, unsolved problem in recommendation system. So the cold start problem, basically, uh, I'm not, this another disclaimer, I'm not an AI person. So this is what I learned in classes. It's not my active research area. I know ontologies. I know all that part of artificial intelligence, but not a lot of the others. Uh, but I work with some of that. So uh, my definition are probably basic. Uh, but, but for this course, it's more than fine. Uh, the coarser problem is the problem that you have in a machine learning, especially uh, oriented recommender system, when you have to recommend an item to a person that you never seen before. So you just logged in on Netflix. Which movie is Netflix going to recommend to you? It doesn't know your preferences. It doesn't know how many movies you have watched. 
because it's your new to the algorithm. It's not trained, it's not personalized on you. So the cold start problem is a problem that is okay, it's a cold start. I cannot start recommending a movie to you, a song to you, because I don't know you. I don't know your preferences. I don't know what you are going to buy after. I need to build an history of your action, of movies that you have watched, of genre that you like, etc., before being able to recommend a movie. So this is a, a problem in machine learning driven recommender system. That uh, how do you Netflix or Spotify or anything else solve this? You just create an account on this service. What is the first thing that they ask you after the credit card number? Input and interest. Bring them knowledge. So that is a way to minimize the cold start problem. Because otherwise they are going to recommend you random things. Instead, in that way you are orienting the recommendation. But this is still a problem. If you just pick a pure machine learning driven recommender system, you don't have. You have this problem. You need to have some tricks like asking the person which are your movies, your genre. Tell me if you like this or not. To just try to orient the recommendation. So that over time, you get the best recommendation as possible. Uh, well, precision and recall. Precision and recall. Who doesn't know what is precision and recall? Okay, precision. Machine learning people. What is precision and recall? It's right, basic of things for evaluating an algorithm. Of machine learning algorithm, no? I suppose. Yes? No? Time. And this is which one? Precision and recall. Good. No, we are all more or less here. Uh, for these kind of things. Uh, it's fine. So there are two metrics, mm, basically, that I Irene give you a very specific uh, definition. Um, and they are a, a binded, right, in a way. So you, if you have high precision and low recall, you have some kind of problem and vice versa. And so ideally, probably, you want to have uh, some balanced metric for, for these things. Uh, for before telling your algorithm is working well, whatever it is well, clearly. Okay, so let's skip expert system. Um, this is probably 99% of the things that you need to know to follow this course about AI. Okay, so because we are not going to speak about algorithms. We are not going to speak about how to implement or how to solve the code. Well, maybe the code start could, could happen, how to build an ontology or how to build a supervised and supervised system. We need to have some basic term to think about AI system, in data-driven AI system. So when I say AI system from now on, just imagine machine learning, deep learning, what that kind of data-driven AI system. Um, because the goal here, as the course name say, is not to go deep on AI, for which we have here many other AI machine learning courses. 
uh, both for data, both for machine learning per se, mimetic learning, genetics, evolutionary computing, whatever. But here we are going to take the perspective of humans. So uh, how many of you follow that? Well, I suppose many of you. How many of you follow IE course on AI? You get trained on your own or you follow some courses? Nobody follow courses on AI? Count. Yes. So you, you, you didn't you didn't follow a machine learning course? Never? No? Oh, it's fine, but <laughs> I mean. Okay, let's do again the question. How many of you followed at least once in your life a machine learning course? whatever, which you tell you how to be, be bring to build a, ma a machine learning algorithm or use it or something like that. Okay, good. It's better that you're doing research on these kind of things and you're not even have a proper traditional training. It, it seems a little bit strange, not impossible, but strange. And And, um, okay, in these courses, so how many of these were at the university level? If you aren't sure, say yes. Okay, and so what do you learn in these courses, for instance? And this, some of these things, I suppose, and so you, you learned how to train a machine learning algorithm, probably. Maybe one simple one. Yes, probably. And what else? To evaluate a machine learning system, an algorithm? No? Yes, okay. And, and what else? Well, in your search, uh, you are, most of you are doing machine learning or deep learning or et cetera. Um, you, you evaluate, you build algorithms also. At least some of you, right? Hopefully. And um, for, for doing something. And so let's speak again, let's think about these courses. How many times in these courses it's not a, a difficult question, just, uh, it's very easy. How many times in these courses the word human or person or any variation of it was pronounced? You can pick zero, one, two, three. Zero. And yes, that is the, the classical answer to this question. I can bet money next time that I was going to ask this and put 10 euros on the table um, if I see more than zero as a number. Um, and it's fine because they are focused on the technical part of machine learning, how to build an AI system, uh, forgetting people. That is a huge mistake. And this is a very personal opinion. But it's, it's right that they all, you also need this kind of, of courses to understand, to build, to, to do the technical work. Uh, so here we are not focusing on those things. We are focusing on putting human in the equation. Especially if your algorithms at certain point, and typically they are, they will be used, they will be used or they will impact humans in some way. So if there are robots doing maintenance in a closed space 
uh, without any human intervention ever, then probably it's fine to ignore all these things. But in any other case, a recommendation system, natural language processing, even a robot that is doing a service robot, that is doing some service to a person or a group of people, then human cannot be neglected at all or not considered, not put in the, let's say, equation. And in addition to that, as you see in this picture, in these many pictures, uh, also in our not research life, but in the daily life, we can say that AI is everywhere. So even if you don't be in the AI field as a research, you have to do some degree with AI system in your maybe not daily life, but almost. Do, do you recognize some of these pictures? Yes, and the, the other question, you already know what they are. So the first, the, the black tube there. This thing here, what is? It's an Amazon Echo, yes. It is a smart speaker with uh, Alexa and as a voice assistant and uses natural language processing to understand what to say and to provide an answer hopefully proper to what you said. And it's AI. It was trained on sentences in different languages, etc. Um, this one. Yeah, Google Assistant, so same things, well, not same things, but same category of the other, just in a different box, uh, with a screen. The other one doesn't have a screen. Um, well, this one, do you know what is this one? Probably not. Anybody? This is a, an Apple software, it's called Create ML that uh, should help or support, especially not uh, expert in machine learning to create machine learning system, especially classification. So you just drag and drop images of things and then you can label it and create a classifier, maybe not very uh, innovative or very, very precise or whatever, but you can create some machine learning algorithm with just dragging and drop images there and pushing some button and, and it also generate a model for programming that after as the next phase. So if you are developing for iOS or Mac OS or iPad and you need a machine learning algorithm, you can use this as first step towards the creation of a, of a model for your application. So also in code. Okay, this one. More or less, I, I have no idea exactly what it is, but what could be? It's not a risiko. Uh, yes, it's something that has to do with biomedical images. It's a grade uh, one, two, three, so probably some masses or something like that. Yes, for biomedical systems. It's again, AI trying to identify patterns or structures that are, that could be problematic and dangerous. This one, it's a car, right? Okay. And which feature characteristic has this? It's self-driving, yes. It's, it's an actual car, a Uber car in Pittsburgh. Uh, I don't know if they are still on the road, but you can call it up to last year, let's say for sure. Uh, if you need a Uber in Pittsburgh, you can, you can receive an Uber with a human driver or you can receive this without the human driver. So it's fully autonomous car driving in the city, open in the city. Um, good. So when it works, clearly it is, it's nice, it's great. And sometimes when it falls, uh, especially in this product that we, we use, it does it in a very spectacular way. Um, so uh, there are many videos on, on YouTube, for instance, 
about Alexa, don't understand the accent, or doing also dangerous things, but it's not in spectacular part if they are doing dangerous things, clearly. Uh, or there is the Tesla, or the Tesla is lovely. Um, the Tesla smart salmon, that, that thinks there is a Tesla. Um, well, you know wh what a Tesla is. Not the person, the car, okay? Yes. Even the person, you should know what is, who is, but. Um, and you know what is the smart salmon? You don't know what is a smart salmon. The smart salmon is um, a feature of Tesla cars that if you have a Tesla car, uh, you have uh, an app on your phone, and if the Tesla car is parked in a parking slot, you go out to the supermarket, you can open the smartphone app and click came here or something like that. And the Tesla, with this function, when this function is active, uh, reach you autonomously, leave this parking slot and came to you. That you are out of the supermarket with uh, groceries and you have the car in front of you and you can open it and, um, and, and use it and then drive away. So this, it's automatic, right? So wherever you are and whenever the car is on paper, the car leave the parking slot and reach you. Reach your phone, actually, not you, but you are with your phone and in theory you are there. Hmm? So it seems uh, a good things, and I'm pretty sure that Tesla tried, the people in Tesla tried this system, this AI system that needs to recognize not only follow the GPS signal, but recognize the street, recognize other cars, uh, signal stop, uh, etc. other cars, other people, etc. before hmm, releasing this in the world. Uh, it seems reasonable. Uh, and then if you, if you click here, I've prepared this, this video already open, we can watch it. Um, uh, a bit, this, this person uh, create, um, would like to try this smart summer. This video is from uh, 2019, mm? and this was pretty new. Just get an update with the smart summon. So just get a software update in your car, and when the car restart, you have this new feature. And so this person would like to try this, and this is a video that it was in a parking lot. See? It blurred, but uh, it's in a parking lot, and um, you, you call it, you call the car, the car should came. Quite a simple, uh, as an idea. And this person recorded a video, so you see the car over there that is leaving and is trying to move uh, to this person that is there uh, until it stops because there is a sidewalk. There clearly the car cannot go on the sidewalk and then try to do something, try again, because why not? And then stay there and then a little bit and then go back and then and then get stuck there. And so in this video that is four minutes long and continuous clearly and then at a certain point he decide to uh, just change and go to the other side because clearly I'm here and the car is going on the other part but um, so this person try more and more time moving place etc. So it's a pretty easy there is no strange, strange things there. It's plain. There are no car movement, so it, it should be relatively easy. So I try again, and the car decides to go crashing, not almost go crashing into another parked car. Um, this is a feature. Probably they update it again. But if you watch this video, you see a lot of these um, failed tentatives. So again, I'm pretty sure that, uh, and you can also find more fun video than not this with the Tesla smart salmon. And, and again, I'm pretty sure that Tesla as in the factory tried this, not just once, before deploying a software into the world. And probably it worked, it worked quite, w quite well with a high precision. But again, 
the world is probably a little bit more complex and unpredictable. And people doesn't not help. Maybe it's the GPS signal that is not good, maybe it's the phone of this person, maybe, who knows, the sun direct with the, uh, to, the si to the sensor that is creating problem. And you cannot recreate in a lab or in a controlled experiment, a controlled setting, every possible condition in the world. Otherwise, you will never ship anything. And so this person tried to try again, and eventually, I don't remember if eventually got his car or, or not, probably yes. Um, but this is clearly uh, an artificial intelligence system, quite complex, that doesn't work well. And in this case, it doesn't create damages, actually. So nothing really to be worried. Um, you can have also, this is a smart salmon. The car decided that the grass was the street, so jump on the grass, and then got stuck there. Um, so the person need to go to the car and unstuck the car from that place. Mm -hmm. So you can smile with this kind of things and say, okay, it will be improved at a certain point in time. Uh, but so other times they are really problematic. And uh, maybe they are very good done from a technical perspective, from an algorithmical perspective, right? Um, so this, so Tesla is not the first people that came around in the world. Here we have IBM, so also IBM is not the first one that came out in the world now fresh with a degree and let's, let's build a system with AI. So they are big companies. And uh, read what happens here. Here happens that in an hospital, uh, they have a system. Hmm? Uh, well, here the, the text say uh, different things, but let's focus on the last one. Uh, we have a system in an hospital that is making, let's say, radiologists, hmm? Rad, rad, Rx, to, to people. And they have this AI system that automatically try to understand whether there is a certain kind of disease in this picture that is taken from the machine. And they had this uh, system deployed in a hospital. And the system was wonderful. It worked very, very well. So at the same level of the human, of the doctor, that was seeing the same picture. And so the company say, great. We have a very good system. It make the same error or less than the human classifying that specific disease. I don't remember what it is, but it's not important at the case. So what they did, they said, well, let's sell the same system to another hospital. Why not? It's a software. Get radiography, you analyze that and give results. And in this other hospital in the United States, so basically the same system more or less, it doesn't work at all. Give random results, totally random results. Um, and they needed a while to understand why. Um, but you have this, a system, an artificial intelligent algorithm, a machine learning algorithm that's working very, very well in one hospital. Then you move that to another hospital and you have disaster. Why? What do you mean custom? But, but the system, the, the software was for a Rx, of pictures of, I don't know, let's say, bones on, on in the leg. And, and so this is, and then you move the system to another hospital where they have same Rx, or the same leg, and, and it doesn't work at all. Closer, but probably not, not in this. So it, it worked 
this case. I mean, it doesn't work that clearly, but closed. What you say it's closed. Any other option? No, no, no. No configuration error. Yes, more or less. What happened was that, again, I don't remember exactly the details, but what happened that that system didn't recognize these or whatever it is. They recognized an artifact on the, uh, on the radiography. So by chance, that hospital, when the person was positive to that kind of things, there was that artifact present. When wasn't, uh, that artifact was missing. So basically the system learned to recognize the artifact, not the disease. And when they moved it to another hospital, the other hospital has a different brand of machine for doing the same photos, and that artifact was not present anymore because this is another, another machine. So like I recognize the brand of the machine printed on the picture. If there is the brand, I say yes, it's a disease. If there is not the brand, no, it's not a disease, or something like this. That is, the algorithm it worked, it just recognized the wrong thing. And by chance, in one hospital, it learned to recognize not the disease per se, but the brand or the artifact that is printed on the picture. So clearly they had to get away with the software and say, sorry, we, we are changing work, uh, we're changing job, um, but and so this seems very, very simple as a problem, right? How do you don't recognize that system trained on a brand, on a picture in the picture and not on the actual thing? But they did it. They not only leave the industry, the company, but you, they already deployed it in a system like an hospital. You can kill people if you leverage too much on this technology nowadays, at least. Um, so why this might happen? This might happen for a possible hmm, reason. Uh, could depend from the standard machine learning process that is explained probably in all the courses that we follow. So what is the, the classic approach? You get data. Um, I want to build a classifier for chairs. So I get a bunch of pictures of chairs. I go to Ikea and make pictures of chairs and make pictures of everything that have a good variety of positive and negative pictures. And then at a certain point, I, I will try to build the model that at a certain point I uh, would like also to have new uh, elements, right? New sample that are not contained in the original data to check if everything is work. And then there is what is called here the AI magic, and it's not really magic, as you, we know. Mm, this is more math, but there is something. You get data, you get a model, and then you, that you can create with it. And then you get instances to the model and you get prediction on result. So we train this model with a lot of chairs and a lot of images that have or not have a chair and we label it, for instance, say, okay, this is a chair, this is not a chair, and then we train this model. At a certain point when we are confident enough, according to some algorithm, a decision tree, or other things. Uh, and then we get new instances, new sample of the data, new kind of chair, like this one in this room, and you give that to, to the model, and you look at the result. And see, okay, yes, I give this chair, and it's recognized with a certain percentage as a chair or not. And if not, 
maybe it's right or maybe I need to go back, change the data, change the algorithm, improve something until the result is something that it's good enough for my specific case or my specific use case. Or in general, if I'm trying to do the, the most general purpose possible chair recognizer. Yes, no? More or less? Is it more or less the traditional model for machine learning? Do you agree? Or you disagree? What is missing? Yes, the validation. But let's yes. Let's say that you get the results, you get the information to decide whether this is fine or you need to tweak something in the AI algorithm or in the data or in the instances. And so you get new results and then you can iterate. Yes, th this is not pictured, but yes, imagine let's that there is each element. The people, the person, who said the user? Not the user, not only the user. Yes. People are missing. No? Who is going to do the algorithm? Developers or engineer or searcher that are people typically. Um, who is going to collect the data? People. Sometimes it's generated even by people, maybe the number of clicks on a website. It's the person that generates the data. In the picture in an hospital, it's by a person, made by a person, on another person. Who is going to see the results? Who is going to say if it's validated good enough? People. That are never, as you said in the, in the courses before, so that question should have asked, I should have asked this question here, but you already said zero time in machine learning. But here there is a lot of point in which people got into the process and can mess things up, can introduce bias in the data, can bring their own assumption, their own expectation in the algorithm, in the data, can ignore some factors while providing instances. So if, it, if this is at, let's say, a research level or something like this, maybe it's also fine up to a certain level because if it's just for, just for uh, writing a paper and saying my algorithm is 3% better than the state of the art and this is enough, maybe it would be fine. But again, if this moves in a robot, I, I, I read that some of you does a robot, or uh, in a home, in a hospital, the biomedical sector, then it's not something that you can ignore. But again, the typical approach is, let's not speak about people. People, people of who? And so again, in this course, we are not um, going to, to go deep on this model. That is the model that they teach you. This is something that you probably have more experience than, than even than us in creating AI system. What we are trying to convince here is that people uh, and not technology should be at the center of these are wonderful microphones um, these rooms um, the people and not technology like the microphone that I'm sure that they tested it uh, and worked well 
uh, but not after one hour. Um, mm, it, it needs to be at the center. Mm. So most co courses, we said, doesn't really think about an interface towards people. Even maybe some af after an afterthought, like if you build a recommender system, for, for sure you need at a certain point something that recommends this thing to a person to say, okay, it's recommending right or not. You have metrics, but you can also have the actual recommendation. And several times, as you, you have said, they don't even mention hmm, humans, and it's fine. Again, I, I, I'm not anti-machine uh, learning. I don't want to say that it's bad, that they should not do this. Well, they could maybe include people in something just because they are part of the of the process and they are part of the problems that can emerge and they could be part of the solution that can emerge. Um, so yes, I, I'm also criticizing a bit this part, but it, it's also important to know how things work, how to build algorithms, what is metrics, how they apply, etc. So this is fundamental for working on machine learning. Just don't forget, and this is again, the goal of this course, this is just a big introduction, remember, um, that people are part of the process, needs to be part of the process. You want that things work well. If you don't care, well, you can skip it. But if you want that things go we work well, when people are involved, then you need to consider. So the question is, why don't consider people from the beginning and along all the design, all the algorithmical choices in an interactive way. In the data, in the instances, in the validation, in the presentation of results, we can consider people. We should consider people. And as I said before, AI systems are, in the end, designed by people. Often, to solve a problem that is a first people-made problem. Not that the computer has a classification problem. The computer can care less if this is a, a chair or not. It doesn't use the chair, typically. Maybe a robot could, but not, uh, not a computer. So typically, the problem is solved. It's made to solve a problem framed by people. Um, again, you, as developer, or engineer, or researcher, are making choices. Which algorithm to use? how to clean the data, which data to collect. You evaluate and test it, which metrics are we going to use? Which is the pro and the cons of these metrics? Which is the impact of these metrics? And then often it as an outcome for humans and it's also presented, as I said before, with a user interface that could be a graphical user interface or not also a graphical user interface. Think about Alexa. You don't have graphics there, just voice. So that push, that uh, model, the standard model, brings to an idea, an implicit idea, that algorithms are the answer. Uh, okay, maybe this is quite theatrical, but uh, you get the, the meaning. And but it's not true. And you have experience. I think we, we already made an example on this in your, let's say, daily life. If you go on Netflix for the first time, which movie should, you, should Netflix recommend to you to watch? It's the cold start problem of this course. The algorithm needs input from you to work decently and not propose something randomly. Um, this is another example. Do you know what is this GIF picture? You have a slide. It's the iPhone Face ID setup. Hmm? Let me know. This is clearly there is an algorithm behind that needs to recognize your face, your features in your face, and just yours, possibly, not the one of the person close to you. And 
this is a very good example of a user interface that thinks about people. How can we get people easily to get all the information that I need to work properly? The algorithm could be perfect, but then if you have a very complex system to input this data, or take a picture here and then take a picture in this other, no, 30 degree on the left, turn more illumination, more light. What does it mean for a cu customer of an iPhone? More light, or incline the camera up 30 degree. Instead of an animation rotating and showing you in real time the feedback, what happens, moving the head, and then, okay, now move again, and then this blue animation there is more effective, quicker, and probably nicer to get all the information that is needed. So this is not something that impacted the algorithm per se, but it's something that impacted the entire experience of the person with this algorithm. So a suitable user interface, as written here, is critical also to overcome some limitations, like the, the cold start problem. Without a user interface, without asking information, again, not only graphical, you, you need those to overcome some limitation of the algorithm, some technical algorithm. And we will try to convince you in these 25 hours that keep people involved and considering them since the beginning of the design phase of an AI system, an interactive AI system, so where people is involved, when it's made by for people, is fundamental. So the challenge here that we would like to solve here is how to ensure that people use these AI-powered interface, system, robots, whatever, without frustration, but with joy, say. And how can we design and evaluate systems, AI systems that are human-centered, in which you have the algorithm, in which the algorithm has good metrics on the AI perspective, but also as good, let's say, metrics when it's going to be used by people. There could be developers, it could be end user, it could be customer, if you are going to the market. It could be the one that give you data, maybe to have good data, good quality of data, before starting the process. In choosing the algorithm, best algorithm for the solution. Why assist an AI system cannot help you choosing the best algorithm for a specific problem? It could. It's a programming tool, let's say software engineering area. And also, how can we avoid or at least minimize problems, failures, ethical issues, etc., biases in AI system? So we will try to cover this. We are not solving these challenges Otherwise, we will probably not be here. Um, but we will try to give some seeds to, um, to move that um, in this direction. Uh, so, this, let's say, framework of human AI um, put human AI interaction put their own uh, foot on uh, a field that is called human-computer interaction um, with differences. So some of the things that we know from human-computer interaction that is a multidisciplinary field but is also close to computer science and computer engineer and also design uh, can be applied with artificial intelligence systems because it's a computer in the end. But then there are some differences that are proper of AI system. Mm -hmm. uh, so what we 
well, we can skip this, but what we typically say uh, in, in human computer interaction, then when you build a system, you want that the system is usable, useful, and used. Because if you have a system that is just useful, but terrible to be used, nobody is going to use it. Or you will, people will leave. And similarly, if you have a use system that is very, very difficult to use, and it's totally not used, you know, not useful, it's just for, at a certain point, people will stop using, etc. You can combine these three words, used, usable, and useful in any way that you want. Um, and we need, and I'm speaking especially, uh, how many of you came from the, an engineering background? Okay, lucky you. Um, so the, you. You know how are, or not, yes, in this case, lucky you. And our attitude, and I, I put myself in this, is this one. If you give a, uh, a developer, an engineer, the, the, the task to build a user, uh, graphic user interface. You came up with these things. Okay, not actually these things. Uh, like this one was actually fictional. This was made on purpose. Just to get the worst possible choices that you can put in a user interface, here we are. This was made by purpose. So clearly this is this made by design. But this is real. This is a uh, software engineer, a developer, software engineer that decided to create a graphic user interface for a command line tool. And he was bored to write on the command line all the optional remembering by memory and said, why I cannot do a graphic user interface? I can. I know technically how to build a graphic user interface. And it decide to, to do this thing here. That if you look at it, even if you know what Bugatti is, wh where to start? It's start, is pro mode, I don't even imagine what is pro mode here. Uh, is add, oh, I need to configure, or why exit is up on, on after pro mode, and and these retrieval options are mutual exclusive, or I can check everything. Uh, it worked, probably, <laughs> if you know how to, uh, how to use it. But you need probably a, a manual, and probably it's easier to open a command prompt and type by memory the things that are not using this for the first time. But this is a little bit of exaggeration, but this is actually real, so it's not uh, real an exaggeration. But this is our attitude of computer engineer or engineer in a certain point. Bring technology first. Even if it's implicit, even if we are not doing this for, well, I'm generalizing, I'm sure that is not 100% uh, the case, but probably 99.5, yes. Um, so in this 99.5 um, people that study engineer or computer science, etc., this is this push towards technology. This let's try this because it's cool because we think that is neat. We people like us think that is neat, and this is also reflected in some part of the research, but not by say my opinion, not by uh, um, malevolous perspective, just because we are trained to think about technology, think about technical stuff, to build algorithms, to build systems, and not to consider, not to design with people that are not us in mind, or with people in mind. So this is applied in general to computer system, but clearly could apply even worse on, um, on AI, and why AI is particularly important here uh, because actually uh, it is said that both discipline, AI and human computer interaction, 
that are, by definition, very different, right? AI is studying uh, the past, generally AI, how to recreate an intelligence of a person in, in a computer system, you know, the general AI. Um, and now it's more on the technical part, how to build algorithms more performant, more less energy hungry, etc., or to enable robots to do things, etc. Um, and HCI that study how to support people in doing their goal, what they need with any kind of computer system, not just a uh, computer like this or smartphone. This person, this is Jonathan Grandin in 29, in 29 uh, said that historically, uh, both of them explored the nexus of computing intelligent behavior. And another person that we probably will mention um, next time, uh, actually say that the they, are, they were very close as a field. And then they split up at a certain point. They take a different way. So there are some common roots. There were some common roots that could be taken again. And, uh, and we'll try in this course to build upon both disciplines thinking about AI, but thinking about people and how people interact with AI. So what is the difference to you between a person using a word processor, Word, and the same person to write a document, and the same person using an AI-powered word processor to write the same document? Which could be the difference to cases to you? Mm -hmm. Okay, this is fro from more the, the, the operative part, uh, but yes, this is more an operative difference. But think about uh, what can uh, go wrong or not go wrong um, from as a quality of the computer system. So you have Word, you can do some things on Word, and you can do also other things with this. AI powered version of Word that has natural language processing and whatever. Which could be one difference? One big difference. Not operatively, clearly, one you have to type, you have to do everything alone, and the other one could have some support. It's under, and if not, And if it's fail, hmm. if I say, I, I have a text, like you said, I have a title, I have to put title centered, uh, font 30. And in the traditional world, I select the text and click on centered and click on font size and select 30. Uh, can, yes, but can it fail? in doing these two kind of operations, centered and, and thirdy, with word. Absolutely. No, no, the normal. No, because I am full control on this, right? In the AI powered, it can fail to do this, hypothetically. Sh shouldn't, okay, but we are, again, let, let's stay in the real world. Um, in the real world, yes, it could. Like Tesla, we see the example of Tesla before. Yes, it can. I can say center. Maybe I have a strong accent. Uh, this is doesn't understand centered, and maybe write something like center instead of moving the title center. So these two cases: normal system which I have full control, and the system cannot do this error, and the other one in which it may or may not 
make a mistake. Not me, not I. I, I I'm doing the same things in both cases at the best of my possibility. But the system is behaving differently. How we can say this is a property, this possibility of making mistakes is a property of that system, of any AI system, when you put a human in the middle, typically. So what is the difference in AI system? Is that they are based, especially machine learning one, data-driven one, they are typically performed under uncertainty. Even classification, it tells you that this is a chair for 98%, and for 2% is a table. And you say, okay, 98 is quite a high, so it, I can confidently say that this, but you don't get a 100%. Because you have probability, you have uncertainty in the system, in the algorithm. And when you give an uncertain system, to people that are a mess, that are not perfect, that make mistakes, that can have issues. It's a vocal system, I have a strong accent. It's a vocal system, I have problem with my voice. I have a problem with pronouncing some letters. The system is operating, is already operating under certainty and Put these two entities together, the person that is operating under a certainty and can make mistakes, and the computer that is operating even much more with an AI system under certainty and will make mistakes. Remember the Tesla that decided the grass was a street? Probably 90% of the time got it right, the street, but those 10%, those 3% of the time, it go on the grass and not on the street. It operates uncertainly. When you put these two complex entities together, you have to consider that problem arise, for sure. At certain point, some problem will arise. Big problem, small problem, hopefully small problem, hopefully fun problem, like, oh, my car got stuck there. Nothing got armed. Everybody's live is alive. No problem. But you have to consider that. You cannot imagine that it will work always well. And this is a design decision. And for design, I mean progettazione in Italian, not industrial design. That is a design decision in the algorithm, around the algorithm, in the data. So they often produce false positive or false negative. In any case, maybe small for positive, maybe small for negative, but they produce it. And they can also be incorrect. Not only uncertain, but also produce incorrect result. Imagine a classification. Is this a chair? This is a chair for 49% because it's broken. And, or better, the one in the room. Are those chairs? Yes. We know that those are, those are chairs. But if we train the model with normal chairs, they will never recognize that. Because they are closed. They move. They don't have legs. They are so, so different from, from chairs. And if we rely that for recognizing how many chairs we have in this room, we are going to produce incorrect results. Nobody got harmed, nobody's injured, but the result is wrong. Mm? And in the worst case, they may demonstrate unpredictable behavior that could be disruptive, confusing, offensive, or dangerous. If in the example of the hospital before, you get to read, I read uh, um, an article a few days ago on Twitter uh, of 2015, in which I don't remember which big company or which big person, uh, in 2015 said, in the next five, or oh, prediction are the best, in the next five, six years, we will not need radiologists, nor even training radiologists. 
because AI system will solve all the problem for radiologists. 2015, five, six years, 2020, 2020, 2021, now, basically. We still have radiologists, right? And we are still training radiologists. So, if we imagine that, and they change the mind because that those systems specifically are highly critical system because they go in a hospital with people and they can die. So it's, it's really dangerous. So before putting a technology there, oof, should be a lot of care and attention for saying, oh, let's get rid of the people. Let's use only the machine. So they can also be dangerous. So again, people should be considered. So in general, before designing any kind of AI system, you should uh, we should ask these three kind of questions. And then we will see later on this course how to design an interactive, human-centered, let's say, AI system with some methodology, some guidelines proposed not by us, proposed in general in the world. Uh, but the three main questions should be, what problem should be solved? Because the decision say, to AI or not to AI is already a decision, a very important decision. So not, a, not AI is not make everything nicer. Oh, let's put AI there. Most of the time, it's useless. We can do it without AI. We can do the word processor that we said before, all the things of nature or language recognition without a great effort from AI. Uh, so which problem should, we should be solved and which we can skip it? And which approaches match the expectation of people that is going to use the system to solve that problem? And which problem can be solved well enough for our particular use case, our portion of the world, our goal, our interest? So these are three main questions that we would like to, to answer. And again, why we are doing this course, don't forget that this is a very long introduction to the course and to the domain, so some knowledge here and there is, is sparse, but we, we are going to mix a, a little bit things. Uh, well, first of all, there is actually interest in research on the human AI interaction. Um, so typically it's called the human-centered AI, and then there are different definitions of human-centered AI according to if it's a definition from the AI community or from the XAI community. But also explainable AI is not so distant from this just to make a couple of examples. And the idea on this course is to give you starting points and direction and some operative uh, procedure to get started the day after the end of the course if you want to add some of these things practically in your work, future of current work. And all of these will be research-based. They will stem from research outcome. Uh, most of all. Then, just as uh, advertising uh, to, to our university, if you want instead to go deep on AI or human-computer interaction as a separate generic field, I have reported here just four courses, two at master degree level and two at PhD level that are currently offered in separately in the two, in two areas. So in AI, uh, there is, for instance, the machine learning and artificial intelligence course in the master degree of computer engineering. Mm -hmm. um, is anyone, anybody here did this course in the past? Okay, so if you are interested, they can comment on this. Um, or the mimetic learning course that is a PhD course instead. Um, on the HCI side, there is the human-computer interaction course 
uh, in the master degree of computer engineer uh, and that is made by me again so it's a wonderful course uh, I encourage you to attend next year it's in the first semester and uh, okay I'm kidding well I hope that is a good course but uh, it, it's not up to me to say this and then there is a PhD course that I'm not doing that so I'm, I'm not involved in that it's called human machine interaction that uh, is a PhD level course that focus on the human machine but computer part especially with basic information right like the master degree course but smaller and shorter and with something more about virtual reality that we don't cover in the master degree so these are just two four of the many courses that you can can find here or everywhere just in two separate areas mm. we again try to put these things together so uh, let's go a little bit more operative here um, let's try to give some definition before moving to the logistics of the course what i mean for ai here mm. so clearly ai is an umbrella term that encompass machine learning knowledge representation ontologies uh, evolutionary algorithms the kind of things that this mimetic learning course is doing, etc. We are typically speaking about the first one, the data-driven AI, so machine learning, deep learning, etc. Most of the example, most of the things that we are going to see fall around that area. And clearly, there could be also various application area. You, in general, are in various application area of AI uh, and going by memory someone is using computer vision someone is doing natural language processing uh, understanding and processing someone is doing robotics someone is doing biomedical uh, different domains techniques may be similar but they apply in different domains so if I need to give a definition of AI my definition would be uh, this one computer doing things that we expect people to be able to do and like this for example recognize if a photo contains a chair or compute direction from here to IKEA for making the picture for the chair for the classification uh, or infer that a chair is a piece of furniture and this is something that you can do with knowledge representation you know that a chair is a piece of furniture as human being. So why the computer cannot know this thing? Or recommend a movie. Like, let's go watching the latest Star Wars movie since we get that in the first week, first slide. So what do you mean for AI? I copy and paste this from your madness slide for some of your Madden slide, for the first 25, I think, so maybe not all of you are, are represented here. And I highlighted um, some words that weren't highlighted in the Madden slide. Um, and also condensate some ones that are similar. And I was hoping in something different because in 2020 when I did this course for the first time oh we had oh sorry we had a, a lot of, of, of discussion about this because in 2020 here you have uh, you are too good you are too balanced uh, it's not okay it's good clearly but not for this the purpose of the slides and the purpose of that question um, so in 2020 I had in the class more people say oh AI will save the world or more on that tone not on that exact sentences but more on the AI is the best things that could happen in the world forever um, and I had a lot of these people and I, I, and I like it a lot uh, to have discussion on why I disagree on this I totally disagree on this um, but you are more moderate you are saying that the things is thrilling and disturbing at the same time. Why you are so balanced? It's good, but not for the purpose here. And you say that it's so three of you more or less said that is both 
trailing positive and negative at the same time, could be positive and negative at the same time with different wording. Or AI is well-written algorithms that seems, again, you lost an opportunity to be criticized, to seem to be intelligent. And again, three of you more or less. In those lights, maybe you are not even here, but in those lights there are. A clever organization of deterministic operation directed by a clever randomness. Uh, is there this person? Good. You like clever as a word. <laughs> um, uh, an algorithm able to manage something, so training and disturbing, seems to be intelligent, so uh, some characteristics of intelligence. Uh, deterministic operation. And then I like the, the next sentence, sentence they say that it's in an algorithm able to manage something that is not deterministic uh, and also something able to pretend, and again, able to pretend to understand the human view. So this is a quite good definition, balanced definition. Uh, machine doing stuff and solving problems on their own. Um, is there? Yeah, you know, this is the kind of things that I would like to, to criticize more. Uh, a bunch of math for cool application. Then is there this people, this person? Cool application. Yeah. <laughs> uh, just for cool application. For not cool application, you cannot use AI. <laughs> no, I'm joking. Uh, smart machines, again, intelligent machine, capable of performing any task. Tell me that you are here. Any task. Not now, maybe in the future. Uh, something able to discover the unknown, and then two people say an attempt to replicate how human thinks, and you got it uh, with an attempt to that, that make these things more less fun. And these, these two here, are you the, there, please? An invention as big as the fire? No. And a child prodigy? Yes, Philip, uh, a child prodigy. Why a child prodigy? But, I'm uh, still a child yeah. in that sense, uh, okay. Uh, a nice trick to increase productivity, uh, etc. cetera, uh, tools to enhance life, tool for enhance life, it's not here, enhance life. Uh, like a human being, but better. Uh, right, I didn't, you edit it, <laughs> maybe. No, after I copy and paste, maybe. Hoping doesn't kill us all, that is the consequence. Um, yes, let's hope that. Um, now these are your some of your definitions. We, we had a 32 slides, and these are taken from more or less the first 20. The first 20 in chronological order of the dissertion, more or less. So, do you recognize, well, for sure we can recognize some keywords, intelligence, smartness. Uh, we can recognize something, again, it's not particularly fun for me in this moment, but uh, you can recognize also some balancing. That is good. Uh, recognizing that is not, everything is gold. It's not gold, everything. So there could be problem, there could be the other face of the, the, of the coin that is, could be problematic. And, and there could be goals which is the goal of AI that you put here, understanding human behavior, solving problem, not solving problem probably for per se, for the algorithm, solving problem for, for, from others, for others, right? Uh, also, this task to be performed, which task, task probably that, would either replace or help people doing 
Uh, is there a smart machine? Yes, I told you before. Yes, I ask you. Which task do you have in mind? A any task is? Any task. But you are imagining, uh, but you are imagining performing any task, substituting the person, like the radiologist, let's get rid of radiologists because we have, or helping the radiologist to do a better job, or both. Increase productivity and efficiency, again, for people. The machine doesn't need to be more productive, it's already productive on its own, but when you put people in the equation, you get, again, problem. Um, and then there is the human 2.0, like human being, but probably better, hoping that it doesn't kill us all. And then we have, I don't know if this person is here. No? Oh, yes. And we have the winner um, <laughs> of the game. No, surely not a Ryan help helping bot, or probably any other helping bot. Um, uh, in the world, probably. So uh, let's have a look at what your colleague, so other PhD students, more or less in your stage. In 2020, I had this course just before COVID in 2020. It was probably one of the very last classes in person that we had at Politecnico, uh, with the entire course. And we did this game for the first time in 2020, and so this is what they answered uh, two years ago. Hmm? Uh, so computer taking decision are they are thinking i had much more substation here for discussion um a system self-conscious explainable and show creative behavior um system that can make a decision um, transferring human intelligence into machine um etc so here, for instance, there are some of, this, some of these things, at least one thing. Look at this slide. There is at least one thing that you don't need AI to do. You don't need AI, absolutely. Well, clearly, I'm not speaking about taking decision while they are thinking, but there is one thing, at least, that you don't really need AI, which is to you. You don't need AI to delegate a task. Depends on the task, probably. But for the action of delegating, you don't need AI. Maybe you need for doing the task, but for delegation, task delegation is something that exists from ages. The washing machine is an example of a task delegation. You delegate a task to the washing machine to clean up your garments. You don't need AI, you don't probably not even need a computer. Okay, so. Course logistics, so let's speak about course logistics. So let's move away from the introduction, but speak about how to pass the exam. So, uh, what is the teaching philosophy that doesn't really exist? Uh, that's why it's uh, in quotes. It doesn't really exist, a teaching philosophy, uh, or a teaching method, um, or style. It's not really a, a thing, but let's say which is the philosophy behind this course. Um, First of all, uh, this is a PhD course. It's not a master degree course, it's not a bachelor degree course, it's not any other kind of course. And my personal philosophy, and this is my personal philosophy, is that PhD courses, on your perspective, don't, well, I'm recorded, so um, I could be in trouble anyway. But my personal philosophy is that um, PhD courses should either be, should be 
let's say, interesting and or easy. So when I was a PhD student, if the course wasn't interesting to me for what I'm doing with my research, or easy, so it's not interesting and difficult to pass, well, I will have other people follow the course. So following this philosophy, the idea, practical idea, is try to make this course interesting to you that have very different, well, in this moment you have uh, a lot of people working in, in AI, in some kind, but you have very different background. You came from computer engineer, electrical engineer, telecommunication engineer, uh, design, etc. So very varied background, mechanical engineer, etc. So very big background. And we have seen the list of PhD in a moment, uh, in which you are in a role. Um, so it could be something that is, could be interesting for, not just for computer engineers, but for more of you, and not difficult to pass. And that is what one goal, it's in that I apply this to, when I was a student, I tell this to my PhD, my PhD student and pick courses that are either easy or interesting. If it's not interesting and difficult, why? Do other things better. Um, that thing. The second thing is uh, interactivity. This is probably the normal way in which we are we're going to do lectures, especially at the beginning of the course, which I speak, but you also speak. I ask questions to you. If you want, you can also ask questions to me. Not a problem, but this is uh, the normal way of doing it. So something interactive a bit. Uh, we are trying to learn by doing and do by learning. So we are going to have uh, we are going to see in a while, but we are going to have 50% of lectures in this way, well, maybe with more content than, than today's lectures, and 50% of exercise. Exercise in which you work. You try to apply the things that we tell you before the exercise to better understand things and to put it in practice. Um, Programming included. So if you like to program, if you want to program, you have the chance here. If you don't, is it possible to avoid that and still complete the course? And connected to, the, to this, uh, the other philosophy is that to learn something, teach it. Um, did you teach? No, you are most of you are first year PhD students, so probably not you, but not a lot of you. Do you teach in university? Yes. Not laboratories? In class? And when you, maybe at a certain point, uh, will have a class, uh, Maybe a class that is not the same things that everybody is doing in the last 20 years for which you have all the materials ready and you already know what to do. Or it's not the computer science or the mathematics one course that is quite fixed in things to do. You will learn that when you have to prepare what you teach, um, what you're going to teach, you will learn a lot, much more than studying on your own. Because we can transmit only what we have. If we know 80% of an argument, we can transmit probably 50% of that argument, for which we know 80%. So if we know little, we can transmit even less than that. So when we prepare for teaching, we actually learn, and we will try to do this at least once, uh, two, two, two times, twice in this course. One will be next time, in which we are going to do a panel. Do you know what is a panel? No? Yes? No. It's good, and you're going to experiment next time. Uh, in a few minutes, I will tell you what is. Uh, so, who are you? 
uh, this is the information that I got on the on the Portale da Didattica. Where again, again, I have 52 people that is not totally represented here, but when we prepare this course, this is the, the list of PhD topics, PhD courses that you are enrolled in. So maybe not everybody will join it. So we have a big bulk from computer and electrical, electronics and communication engineers, as I would say, I would have expected that. Um, but uh, we have well, four people from the national PhD in AI, only one here, two. two. Um, then we will have another person that is not here because it's isol in isolation for COVID. But at least three of these four will be here, maybe all the fourth, I don't know. Uh, five people in this in the list from management, pro product and design, and we, we have seen before, mechanical engineer, uh, bioengineer, medical, surgical science, metrology, uh, energetics, chemical engineering, aerospace, and civil and environmental engineer. Maybe you are not all here, but maybe somebody is listening from home. Uh, I don't know, but this was the picture uh, that we had in front of us when we say, uh, okay, what we are going to do in this course. And this is more or less the picture that we, I had in, um, in 2020 with half the number of people, so a little bit less variety, but this. And you also have very different research interest. I took this and tried to summarize from your uh, madness slide. So you try to apply uh, information technology and medical sciences in general, sustainable data-driven design, computer vision in various format, hardware testing, uh, at least I, I summarize in hardware testing, uh, graph neural networks, robotic decision support system, virtual reality, swarms and drones, wireless communication, trustworthy AI, natural language processing, software engineering, etc. Then the slides was over. Um, so very different topics. So natural language processing and medical sciences really could be really from different perspective, even if it's in the umbrella of, of AI. Hmm? Uh, well, yes, who are has, um, I already introduced myself, um, and how can you reach out to, to us? We are doing this course in two. These are the same two people that were listed in the first slide. Uh, there is me that I'm going to do the first half of the course, more or less, as I said before, I am an assistant professor um, in tenure track, if you want to use the, the English definition, or if you like the, the Italian ricercatore a tempo determinato di tipo B, um, in the Department of Control of Computer Engineer. My research topic is human computer interaction applied to complex settings. It could be Internet of Things, it could be other kind of environment or uh, discipline in which we have complexity bring by people typically or by the system per se like a smart home in which there are components of artificial intelligence that do things on their own and but there is a person that is living in the house and would like to live there in, and be sane and well I have a, an email address clearly and then there will be Alberto that will follow more or less the second half of the course uh, that will be a little bit more practical. And he is a postdoc. So he completed his PhD in 2020. Uh, he's now a postdoc. His research topic is on digital well being, so within human computer interaction specifically. And uh, well, it's, it's a postdoc of mine, and it's in the same department. So we are two computer engineers uh, by, by formation, and that is his email address. Uh, these are the course topic that you already have seen on the internet. Um, but most importantly, uh, you also have seen that we have a website in which we, we have all the materials. I put this sort of table yesterday evening, uh, so that especially if you have some trouble in joining, you can see, maybe here is small, you can see when there is a lecture with the material, with the link to the video recording of the lecture, and when there is the exercise. 
for the material and not the video recording because in the exercise you are going to do things and so there is no, no meaning of recording two hours of noise in the room. Um, and well, you are encouraged to attend the class with your laptop as you already did. Uh, we had seven classes, as I told you before, 50% will be lectures, more or less, and 50% will be exercises that will help you to pass the exam. Uh, we will also ha always have three, four hours per class. Some classes will be three hours, like today, other four. Uh, and the schedule is the one that you already have seen with one change, small change with respect to the email that you received, the change is that the next class would be four hours instead of three. And as a consequence, the third class will be three hours instead of four. We just shift one hour from the third to the second class. Because originally, the panel should have planned for the third lecture, but then yesterday, I decided to anticipate the second one because it makes more sense. Um, and so I, I also need to calibrate the hour consequently. So this is just the, the, the only change that is already on the teaching portal, that is already on the website. Just in your email, you have the wrong time for these two. So we are just finishing one hour later next time and one hour earlier in two weeks. Uh, sorry, always next week. And we will have always this, hour, this, this room and in two cases, I don't know why, uh, Polytechnic will give us room 29B. That should be even bigger than this. Um, and with the power outlets to each desk, as this one, like this one. Um, what's the plan? So today, First line, course introduction, introduction to human eye interaction, the things that we more or less said already. And the logistics, and the th things one, the things here, and um, the madness session that we are going to do after. Next time, exercise. So the things in bold are the exercise. And we are going to have four exercises. Three group-based exercise, one individual, just one individual. And all these exercises will be done, probably, possibly, in class. So you will have time here to do all you need to do. No homework, let's say, for most of these exercises. So when you leave that room, you have probably completed if not 100% of your work, 90%. Mm -hmm. With the one exception that is the panel for next week, for which you need to be prepared. And then I will tell you what, what you mean for what I mean for prepared. Mm -hmm. So you see, there are four exercises. The panel here next time. Then there is the journey map. Do you know what is a journey map? Design. What is a journey map? It's, yeah, I'm trying to repeat. It's a, a graphic, what you said, um, a scheme, a scheme, a picture, a graphics, it could be made in different way, that um, depict the, the journey, hmm, as the name say, uh, on a specific topic, or to reach a specific goal. Hmm, that could be for a product, is all the steps that you need uh, from the inception of the product to the delivery to the product, of the product, so if you want to draw a journey map for a master student, the journey map starts when the master students uh, enroll, decide which university to enroll, then enroll to the university, then go to the classes, then uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, up to the, the degree. Uh, if you want to do a journey map for your own day, you start this morning at the hour that you wake up and you 
highlighted steps that brings you here with respect to specific goal. And we are going to do a journey map related, clearly, to AI and humans. So we will have a specific goal um, related to, mm, all, all of these are always related, except the panel, always related to the topic of the lecture before. So the journey map will be in the fourth lecture and will be so li like the last two hours of the lecture and will be related to the things that we are going to discuss, that you are going to discuss with Alberto in the first two hours about paradigm for human interaction. And then the same things here, this design evaluation workshop will be a workshop in which you try to tweak or reflect on the design of a fictional AI-based user interface for running and, and evaluate them and evaluate it with methods that we are going to tell you in the, the two hours before in the class. And then we'll have the fourth exercise here that is a case study um, that will design and implement in some way a prototype conversational agent, a chatbot. Keeping in mind everything that we said in that up to that moment. So uh, we try to put everything that we said up to the moment and concentrate in one project, a small project. And we are going to give you some information about how to design and implement some example. Uh, we're going to use our online platform for implementing the natural language processing part, but you can feel free to use other things here in lecture six and then all the rest of the lecture except probably the first hour that is introduction is work group and then lecture seven will be again work group plus the final presentation of your um, designed and prototype conversational interface under the umbrella of the human ai framework that we are going to to tell you in this up to that point. How to pass the course? As I sa said before, we have four exercises, four practical activities that need to be carried out in class. Um, as I said before, all of them, except one, will, be, will need to be prepared before sorry, in the class, during the class, uh, just the panel needs to be, have a bit of preparation before the class. It's the only one that is individual. Uh, to pass the exam, you have to complete with success three of these four activities. Any, three or, three or four. It could be the first, the second, the third, and skip the fourth one that maybe has a little bit of programming, or skip the panel and have all the other three, or doing the first, the third, and the fourth, three of them. Mm -hmm. If you complete with success all four of them, you got this merit. You not only pass the course, but pass the course with merit. Um, <coughs> these are, let's say, not complex things to do. And again, we are doing this, except the panel, in class. So you are just have to use the time that you are here to work on the things that we are going to tell you before and we're giving you instruction and guidance and help to do those activities. Uh, what means with success? It means that in the panel, for instance, that you don't know what is, but trust me for now, uh, you are participating and you are speaking, if you speak, and you are asking questions, if you need to ask questions, you're just participating. In the journey map that your group probably create a journey map that is reasonable, sufficient, that is a journey map, is not um, a pie chart, uh, and fulfill the goal. Uh, with the design evaluation workshop that you complete the four activities that will be part of this workshop in group. And for, for the case study that you design and prototype and present in the last class, 
what you did during the class hour prob mostly, if not all. This is what we mean for success. You did the work and did the work reasonably well, on topic, at least. Any question on this? No. So, let's cover this part. Since we are in some COVID times, um, so what happens if you cannot attend the class, especially for the exercise? You, you actually need to, to deliver the exercise. So the preferred way to follow the course is in person, as you are doing now. You are the teacher. However, since life happens, and always life happens, you know that lecture will be video recorded and shared, hopefully. The audio is, is recording well. Uh, group exercise, there are three out of four exercises, can be done in a hybrid format, meaning that at least one person per group needs to be here. Because maybe there is some question to ask, and the hybrid setting is still a mess. It's problematic, having three groups online and the other here. We are going to follow you that are here and ignoring everybody else online. We cannot split attention. As a human being, we have difficulty in split attention between the virtual and the, and the physical world. So we are trying to avoid that. So at least one person per group must be here. Um, if you are all here, it a little bit better, but you can have the other on the computer in your group. So that's why at least one must be here. Uh, for the individual exercise, try to be in the class for the panel. If you cannot, because you, well, maybe not get COVID, but you maybe are in isolation and you cannot move for any reason, because again, life happens, uh, send me uh, an email and we will try to uh, have the remote participation in the panel in some way, um, so we will have somebody probably here on the big screen and everybody else um, at the desk here. Mm -hmm. But that should be really the, the last possibility for the panel. And clearly, if things will go worse than now, we will could also consider to shift the entire course uh, online, but for now, this is not an option. Um, action for you before the 21st of January, make it the groups. We are not going to make the groups for you. You are old enough uh, to create some groups, three, five people as you prefer. It could be in 2020 when it was in class, I, we created the group in this way. You are together, you are close, you are a group. You are close, you are a group. It was by proximity. Uh, now it's not possible because people are also online, etc. But that could be one way to create a group. So if we want to have a group of five people, one, two, three, four, five, and we are a group. Since most of the work is doing here, there is no need to synchronize after the class, etc. So if you already know each other, you can create a group on your own. If not, this could be a, a good way to, to create a group. Uh, three, five people per group. Ideally, four or three. But just to consider people that are online, say we don't know how many people will be here, we'll be online three to five. How to, fill, how to form the group? Just fill out this Google spreadsheet. It will ask you for the name, for five people maximum, and an email of the team leader, so the one that will be, uh, if we need to communicate with the group for anything, 
we are going to bribe this person and if you can if this this person if you can select this person that is a person that will be here so the, if you have a hybrid group try to put the person that will will be more likely to be in class most of the time if not all so that it's easier also to reach out uh, physically by friday 21 because we need the group immediately after the next the lecture after but it's just one line in the form uh, lastly then we are going to do a, a stop uh, about programming i told you that the the final exercise could have some component of programming. It's not mandatory. You can also work out to the to the work along the the exercise without writing one line of code. It's possible um, because it's a prototype, so it's something okay. And uh, you have like eight hours to do that, so it cannot be a really uh, the best product that you are going to create in the world. Um, but If you want to go to the to, to, to the route to programming, do you know enough? Who doesn't know how to program? How to write code? And this more or less in which language? In Python, so yeah. And who doesn't know how to program in Python? Never programmed in Python before. In which language? Okay. But you are in a group, so you can compensate. It's easier, Python, than C++, so just a different syntax. But this is just needed for the case study. And it, it's also possible to complete the case study without programming. So uh, it's not, not really mandatory, but it's an option that many of your colleagues in 2020 had embraced in doing this in programming because especially computer engineers um, loves to, to program and to do this kind of thing. So this is still an option. Um, we are going to give you at least, we are going to give you one example mm, for the case study so that you, if you want, you can build upon that example for your conversational agent. We are going to develop shortly and give you an example of a conversational agent that speaks about the weather because why not so ask the weather uh, what's the weather today in turin and the things will say it's sunny um what's the weather in rome and the answer will be it's sunny so it's a prototype so the answer will be more or less the same given the same the same answer it doesn't need to be connected to a weather forecast system etc it's a prototype it should it should work and should uh, be respectful and uh, designed with some criteria in mind for the human usage. So the answer should be realistic and it should be precise because again, it's a prototype that you are going to do in eight hours, so it's not a lot of time. Mm -hmm. And then we will be here, so if you have any problem with programming, we will be, Alberto actually, will be here in, in, the, in the room. Any question? Good. So we are going to have this so that you can also relax a bit. So how it works? It works that I will show you a slide. This is for instance is mine. I'm not going to speak one minute in this just to save time. And, um, and I'm start a timer. Oh. No, let's do this before. Let me stop the recording because it doesn't need to be 